There's some Buddhist teachers who treat the idea of a self as a logical fallacy. They point out there's nothing solid and nothing lasting about anything that you could claim as a self. Therefore, there is no self. All you have to do is accept the logic and then you don't latch on to anything. That's what they say. Then, of course, people for some reason are stubbornly unable to accept the logic. But that's not the issue at all. We don't hold on to the idea of self because it is, because it is a logical conclusion. We hold on to it because it's useful. We found it useful in many ways. Your sense of self is part of what's called becoming. And every becoming deals with a desire. You take on an identity in a particular world to attain that desire. And that identity consists of at least two parts. One part is the part that is going to experience the pleasure that comes when that desire is enjoyed, when the desire has been met. And the other is the self as the producer or the provider, the part that's actually going to go out and find what needs to be found and bring that desire into reality. And that's the part we hold on to more than anything else. All the various skills we've learned in making use of the body, making use of our perceptions, our feelings, thought constructs, even our consciousness. The reason we hold on to these things is because we found them useful to find happiness. Now the problem is our notion of happiness may be limited, and we may be turning a blind eye to huge areas where we're causing suffering for ourselves by holding on to a particular identity. But the fact that we see it as a useful strategy, a useful tool, means that we're going to hold on regardless, no matter how many times people point out to the fact that form is in constant, feelings, perceptions, fabrications, consciousness are all in constant. Still we feel at least they're constant enough for us to use. And the effort that goes into holding on to a sense of self and clinging to a sense of self is repaid by the pleasure that comes by using that particular sense of self. That's the problem we've got to attack. It's because of our blindness. And we have lots of senses of self. It's not that there's just one self inside. There's a self for each of those desires. And we've gathered them, gathered them up over the course of the years, and they're quite as stable. And some of them we haven't looked at very carefully, but they lurk around inside the mind. Others we're more familiar with. But even then, there are huge areas of blindness around the consequences of a particular sense of self. This is why we meditate. On the one hand, to see that there are these limitations, that the various senses of self we have entail a fair amount of suffering. but also to give us new skills, take on quite a few new selves as a meditator, the self who practices the precepts, the self who learns how to be pleased by generosity, all the selves that go with the different good qualities you're trying to develop. You take those on in a provisional way, but also as a way of changing the balance of power inside. Because although the fights among your different senses of selves inside can be one of the main causes of suffering, still the fact that you have many different selves means that you can change your point of view, get out of a particular self and see it from the point of view of another self, and then begin to see, oh, it does have its drawbacks. And you're not threatened by that fact because you've got another self, another point, to, point of view to look from. Concentration is the big becoming that we're creating here, and the sense of self that's there inside, focused on the breath, at ease with the breath, 
having a sense of belonging, a sense of solidity, from which, from which it can look at other senses of self and ask the question, are they really necessary? Are they really worth the effort that goes into them? This is also helped by being around people who have managed to look at their different senses of self and get rid of a lot of the unskillful ones, so you see that it is possible. And also change your ideas about what's, what's really worth the effort. We tend to be remarkably bad at gauging the payoff of a particular effort. Positive psychologists have noticed this for a long time, that people have ideas about what makes them happy, but if you actually ask them at the moment when they're doing that particular activity, they realize, well, they're not as happy as they thought. But then afterwards they'll dress it up, or beforehand they'll dress it up. large because I don't see any alternative. As the Buddha said, we put up with suffering to some extent, but then we figure that the only alternative is the different pleasures that we can look for. And even though those pleasures may entail some problems, we don't see any other alternative. So we say, well, it's just part of life. You've got to accept that. If you don't break a few dishes, nobody listens to you. That kind of idea. So we have to see that there are other alternatives, and they're more effective. Then you can put aside the ones that are not, not as healthy and not as productive of genuine happiness. And this is how you begin to sort through the various selves inside. So look at this skill as a meditator, the skill of concentration, as one of your important forays into rearranging the, the stable, getting rid of the animals that are really vicious and nasty, and even some of the ones that seem relatively benign, but on closer examination, carry, they have their shadow side as well. And you learn to identify more and more with the self as a meditator. You find that that's where all your clinging goes. And so you can loosen up a lot of your, your clinging to other ideas of self, other old habits. And it's by focusing all your clinging right here that when you finally do turn around and look at the concentration itself, or look at the acts of discernment that you've been doing as part of the concentration, and can begin to see that they too are fabricated, they too carry a level of stress. The fact that a clinging has been concentrated right here means when you let go of this clinging, there's nothing else that the mind wants to hold on to. That's how you gain your first taste of the deathless. With full awakening, they say, it's, you have no more need of a self, because after all, the self is there as a tool for finding happiness. But the happiness of awakening is something that doesn't need a sense of self. In fact, your sense of self is going to get in the way. So you drop it at that point, not because you've decided it's bad or whatever, it's simply that you don't need it anymore. This drop not out of hatred, simply out of a sense of you've outgrown it. So that's where we're headed. It's not a process of just finding out your true self and then denying it, or finding out that there was no self there to begin with. There are all these selves, and some of them will require a certain amount of arguing, a certain amount of negotiating a certain amount of reasoning with them. So it really does hit home that this particular way of acting really does carry lots of drawbacks, and you have a better alternative. Because one thing all the senses of self have in common is that they all want happiness. 
simply their idea of what happiness is and how you get there best can be pretty limited. Their ideas of what's possible are limited. So they can be reasoned with. There's that old problem in ancient philosophy. The question is, do your desires have reason, have any reason at all? There's one school of philosophy that said, well, reason is one thing and desire is something else. And there's another which seemed to be more insightful, saying, well, even your desires have reasons. Otherwise, there'd be no way of communicating with them at all. No way, no way of saying yes or no to them. They would just overpower you. So every self inside has its reasons. And learning the reasons of the selves can sometimes be a really fascinating project. So you can figure out, well, where did they go wrong? Where were they thinking that they were clever? But what did they get wrong so that their cleverness was, was misguided? Because it's only when you see that your desires have their reasons, and from a certain point of view they make sense, that's when you can understand, okay, this is how far the sense goes, and this is when they become nonsense. That's when you can really let them go. If you don't understand their reasons, they're going to hold on, because you haven't dealt with their reasons properly. So the process of meditation is not simply one of noting things arising and passing away. You note them so that you can recognize, okay, this is an event in the mind. And the next question is, what is the impact of this event? And particularly these voices in the mind, what are they saying and why are they saying it? What's their reasoning? This is what the investigation is all about, so you can get past their reasons. This is also why people who have gained awakening don't brag about it, because what they've been doing, they've been discovering how stupid they've been all along, listening to voices in the mind that seemed reasonable, but deep down inside they knew there was something wrong. And finally they realized what it was. It's only when you see that you have been stupid that your discernment really does have a chance. But you can see that these things are stupid only when you have alternatives. So this is why we develop the path as an alternative set of selves, a set of becomings. So the mind doesn't feel so bereft. Because deep down inside it knows, if you say, there is no self, it's like a denial you can't find happiness. And that's not, of course, that's not what the Buddha is saying. He's not saying there is no self. He said, but these senses of self you have are troublesome. Again, you, you hold on because you say, well, you know I need this for these particular kinds of happiness. So we're giving you the, the opportunity to see that there are alternatives. You don't need those old kinds. Of selves, you can get create new ones inside based on your skills. See, so letting go of the old ones without feeling deprived of anything at all. And even when you let go of the path, there's no sense of deprivation. It's because you found something better. So that's where we're headed. So the skills we master in learning how to deal with pain, learning how to deal with frustration, learning how to deal with all the other issues that come up in the meditation. It's all worth the effort, because it takes the mind to a place that's really good.